All right, let's get started. Welcome everyone to the power of familiarity in unfamiliar cockpits. This is another webinar we're doing in the Pilot in Command with the Pros webinar series, and this one will feature Steve Thorne. Steve is the creator and host of Flight Chops. Uh, you can find him on YouTube at youtube.com slash flight chops, and you can see his ratings there. His co-hosts for today will be Thomas Doherty. Thomas has participated in a number of other webinars that we've done. He is the logging team product manager for Four Flight, so if you have any questions or requests about Logbook, they will be directed to him. And you can uh, see his uh, ratings there. He is a CFII, um, and so he will be able to bring a special perspective to this webinar. For today's topics, uh, in slightly in contrast to some of our previous webinars, this is going to be more of a candid discussion between Steve and Thomas, uh, essentially around the idea of how ForeFlight can help you train in unfamiliar aircraft types. So Steve, of course, uh, is someone who is flying a lot of different aircraft types, um, whether it's modern aircraft or uh, a T-6. Um, he just moves between all of these different aircraft, and so he's going to share some stories and examples of how having foreflight uh, on his knee for in all of these aircraft really helps him maintain a sense of familiarity and uh, keep his head in the right place. Followed by that, Steve will answer some questions submitted by his followers, uh, and then from there we will go into live Q&A uh, to answer your questions that you submit through the GoToWebinar message panel. Speaking of that panel, you can open it just by clicking that button on the right side of the window that looks like a question mark. Type in your questions at the bottom, hit send, and our staff will be uh, online to respond to them uh, as you enter them. So we strongly recommend that you submit questions as soon as you think of them. Don't wait until the end when you see Q&A come up on the screen, because if you wait to submit your question until then, it probably won't get answered. So really strongly recommend that you submit them whenever you think of them, uh, and then you can get them answered quickly. We also recommend joining from a computer and not a mobile device. We just tend to find that computers uh, tend to uh, not give you the sort of audio problems that we see people having with mobile devices. Lastly, this session will be recorded, and it'll be accessible at foreflight.com slash webinars sometime tomorrow. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Thomas to kick us off. Thanks, Sam. Uh, great intro there. Uh, well, hi, everybody. I'm Thomas, and this is Steve. How you, uh, you guys may know him from his YouTube channel. Um, I think a lot of us are very familiar with your current flying, the RV and a lot of the great types that you get to fly right now. But... What can you tell us about how you built to that point? What does kind of your early days of flying look like? Yeah, so I mean, really, I was just a typical weekend warrior. I had started in, you know, Cessnas. I mean, it, the earliest days were gliders and then moving on to power and then lots of years of just barely staying current through my college days, doing the absolute minimum for insurance requirements to stay current. And then uh, I kind of found myself doing the same flight, flying around Toronto City Tour in 172. That was like repeat, rinse, and, you know, just doing these flights with pastures. And I didn't feel like I was growing as a pilot. And uh, there was a couple years there, you know, the wife, the family, the, the house, all that stuff happened. And I wasn't current for like almost four years. And during that time, GoPros became a thing and ForeFlight kind of became a thing. So I was able to kind of see digital charts, which to me, that blew my mind. I really couldn't stand working with paper. That When I went from gliding, it was like a yaw string and listening to the sound of the plane. That that was flying to me. But I knew realistically I needed power to do anything, go anywhere. So then it got into this noisy panel in front of me, a Cessna 150 from the 70s that I was flying and trying to deal with paper charts and doing diversions with the pencil and E6 speed. Watching the tools get modern and then being able to debrief with GoPros, it really opened the door to share it with the community and uh, opportunities presented themselves to fly new types. So. In the early days, I, I literally remember opening the hangar door and seeing the Super Cub sitting in the back of the hangar and it just hadn't been flying much. And it was like, literally, it was like a scene from a movie in the back of this dusty old hangar with a dirt floor, blowing the dust off the panel. And I asked my instructors like, can we fly that? And he like literally pulled out the old printout that he had of the tailwheel endorsement thing that they were doing at the school. It's like, yeah, it's still insured. Just no one really is flying it. So. Getting into the Super Cub blew my mind, opened the doors to so much, right? I mean, it was like getting back into the, the Schweitzer 233 
stick in the right hand throttle, well, spoiler control in the left in that airplane, but pulling the spoiler back was the same as pulling the throttle back in, in power in terms of what it would do. So it, the primacy of how I started flying came back to me so quickly and I loved it. Um, but of course, now I'm in a situation where I'm s instantly jumping into different, really outside of my comfort zone familiarity, right? After literally 15 years at that point, I guess it was so flying power, you know, 172. That's kind of all I was doing. Now I'm back to thinking about the way I was flying gliders in the Super Cub. And uh, it's funny, there was another friend of mine who I was flying with. The school also had this beat up old PA32 that had a constant speed prop mod. So that was exciting to me to finally get access to the blue knob, which I'd never flown with. And uh, that buddy of mine said to me, I think I want to master the 172 before I fly the, the Warrior. And I knew enough then to say, I don't know, dude, you're, you're a weekend warrior like me. You're never going to master the 172. So moving into muscle memory that's different, I think it really strengthens your fundamentals to not be stuck in one place. But that also creates a potential for unfamiliarity. And that's where what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, I think I, from gliders to some of the not being able to see over the front of the airplane warbirds that you've been flying, I'd say uh, a pretty substantial difference. Interesting to hear that like the glider work you think really still applies to so much of what you've been doing uh, lately. Absolutely. What's funny is the RB-14 is the newest thing I'm flying. Totally modern, awesome newness. But on the ground, it's it feels just like the um, it's like the T6 really in terms of the eye to ground or the, uh, the sight picture, not the eye to ground height. <laughs> That's very different. So that has been interesting to see because I can apply what I learned there in the T6 to the, the super or to the RB 14 for how I memorize the eye to ground height when I'm taxiing, but I'm blind when I'm taxiing in terms of the nose being in the way, but level flying, it's so, so much visibility. It's so different. So it's, it's, it's a lot of differences. Awesome. I think that's one of the things that uh, most of us who watch your channel are the most jealous of is the variety of airplanes that you get to hop back and forth between. It seems like uh, every other day you're in a new cool airplane to fly around in. Uh, I know you've had like a week of flying a bunch of different types of aircraft, hopping back and forth. Uh, what can you tell us about that kind of gauntlet of different airplanes to have to uh, not do anything you, you don't need to be doing in. Right. So that was pretty recently after getting back from flying across the Atlantic in a DA-62. In the same week, I flew the PA-32, the Cherokee 6, the RB-14, and the Harvard, the T-6, because I wanted to get my currency back. So I was flying all of them in the same week. So trying to jump between all those types is uh, definitely some mental gymnastics. But I have systems in place to to try to mitigate risk there. I mean, they're they're fundamentally different, right? I mean, it, the joke that I make about the Harvard is it's like the twelve pack from the forties, right? It's not a six pack. It's like, and it's not even standard layout. So you go from that to the glass in the RV fourteen with the G three X Touch versus the G one thousand and the, the DA sixty two. That's a lot different, right? And there's fingerprints on the on the DA62 G1000 from me, like having a hard time remembering that's not a touchscreen. Sorry, and, you know, annoying the pilot that I'm flying with because they did put me in the pilot flying position, which I really appreciated for that experience. Um, <clears throat> but it was a lot. So not necessarily being super comfortable, honestly, with the G1000. Um, four flight is there, right? It's my it's my touchstone really that keeps me comfortable with situational awareness, even though the, the panel is highly capable. But the question is, if it's not something you're comfortable with using, then you don't have access to that information instantly, right? And if you don't, when you're flying, you know, two or three seconds is a problem. For me, it's it's been a real touchstone to have in the Harvard, which has nothing in terms of avionics with navigation going into the A62 or the G1 or the uh, RB14 with the G3X touch and the GTN 750, which I'm still learning to use. Um, primarily still still using ForeFlight. Yeah, glad. I mean, I think the idea of ForeFlight acting as that touchstone, that that commonality between very different types of airplanes is really one of the big benefits. And the benefit of it being on a tablet, 
uh, what occurs to me is like the the 62. I don't know if you had a whole lot of prep time before you actually got to go get into the airplane to a G1000 that you're not really all that familiar with. And the ability to take for flight outside of the aircraft, how has that helped you make these quick transitions to different airplanes? Yeah, so I try to show up prepared as much as possible to these things. Sometimes it's hard, but um, <clears throat> if I can get like a high res image and um, I'll sit there and I'll work through for flight. So I'll, I'll work through checklists and I'll, I'll maybe even simulate a scenario like I'm, I'm flying a pattern. I'll try to do it real time. So that kind of thing helps me chair fly or dry time. And if I can get to the cockpit and sit there at the actual airplane, that's even better for muscle memory and where things are located. So I try my best to chair fly or do dry time so that as much as possible, I'm not doing something for the first time in the airplane with the engine running. Yeah, the, the <laughs> flights that you've had in the Cherokee 6, I think that your checklist work, uh, hitting carb ice and flying approaches and things like that, uh, I'm very impressed by how you guys are able to go through and look like seasoned pilots uh, flowing through checklists, talking about what you're going to modify for different situations. Is there anything in particular that you're doing inside of checklist and for flight to help set that stuff up? I guess it's really about um, setting up in advance and then tweaking checklists, adding items. I think I've got the video clip where in the Harvard I edited the checklist and I showed myself editing it in the video to add items that I felt like I needed. For instance, setting the trim in uh, that thing has a rudder trim and an elevator trim, these giant wheels, which you set the elevator to 11 and the trim to three o'clock on these big wheels. And I hadn't flown for almost 60 days in this one particular video. And I set those backwards because I didn't have it in the checklist, which specifically to set to 11 o'clock. So taking off of the T6 with those set wrong was pretty interesting. Uh, that's a lot of, a lot of control pressure. I didn't really want after rotation. Um, so I was able to deal with it, obviously, but I, I changed that checklist to add those items. And I think that having the ability to do that really can customize it to your needs for the situation and the scenario. Yeah, I, I, I've always really appreciated the ability to edit uh, all of the, the checklist items, even in, in different orders or, or add yourself different notes in there. If, uh, if your particular airplane has a quirk that kind of likes uh, things a certain way, uh, one of the things that... Uh, personally, moving from airplane to airplane, uh, I tend to get a little negative transfer on is like V speeds around the pattern. Um, you know, you it's very easy to get to your midfield downwind check and sort of get in the flow of getting an approach set up and, you know, forget what airplane you're in. Uh, yeah. and, and you move around to so many different airplanes. Uh, I wonder if you have any advice on, you know, keeping all of that uh, steady. So I think um, I'm lucky in the sense that I do it so often that I don't have bad habits or muscle memory because I don't, nothing is familiar. <laughs> so it's almost always different. So I almost always look at my cheat sheets, every airplane, I've got a cheat sheet with mo the most important fundamental differences or, or setting power settings, or, you know, for instance, with the Harvard, it's pretty specific about how you set climb power. I need to pull that giant engine back to 27 inches. Then when I pull the prop back to 2000 RPM, I'll see the uh, the manifold pressure come up to 28, which is what I want. Um, so I kind of have a cheat sheet, which reminds myself of all those things I'm going to do for each airplane. So I look at it before I fly something if I haven't flown in a while. Um, so I haven't had negative transfer issues, um, but I think it's because I'm so often in something new. Yeah, I guess that's, uh, that's the benefit of, you know, if you, if you don't have years straight in the same airplane uh it's a little hard to build up that that habit uh in there i guess it's the the luck of moving things around so much which is why i sold my buddy on the concept of don't even attempt to master the 172 just forget about that idea go start flying different stuff and it'll help your fundamentals which it did i convinced him to do it and he was reluctant at first but i, I saw him become a better pilot in the 172 after flying the warrior yeah, I think that is is a is a really interesting point. I, I like the idea of moving back and forth. Uh, it, it relies on you as the aviator to be the constant uh, in all of those aircraft, and and not just 
get used to making that that 172 do what you want it to. Um, I was fortunate enough in in school to fly a lot of different 172s, um, as North Dakota has quite a few airplanes. Uh, I I wonder if you've gotten to fly maybe different RVs that are you know have a little little different quirks than your aircraft does, and if that's you know taught you anything about that airframe. So with the RV, no, actually, I haven't really had a chance to fly very many of them beyond the ones at the factory, which I guess I did get to fly each of them, the fleet there. Um, so yeah, it's really, um, sight picture ground time in the airplane real quick to realize something is somewhere you don't expect it to be or something like that. But I can relate to the 172 fleet issue because that, that is classic, right? Um, it's the same airplane, but, but something is different about the avionics, which can totally trip you up. Even if it's something as simple as the intercom is different. And now you can't hear the radio because you selected the wrong thing or you're not broadcasting when you think you are because you don't know how to select the mic on radio one or radio two um so yeah it, it's really it doesn't matter if it's the same type it's about preparing yeah and, and being able to to take a lot of that info like outside of the aircraft um you know anytime that i'm flying something different i want the the mission and the checklist and all of those sort of things to be not what is keeping me behind the airplane. Uh, I, I want that to be so far ahead uh, that I can focus on those little tweaks, uh, those little differences uh, in each aircraft. Yeah, there is nothing worse than not being able to find a switch or, or a menu item, even if it takes five or five seconds is forever, right? But that can throw you off so severely. So trying to get ahead of that as much as possible. Yeah. I, I always like that on a, on approaches too. I, I it's amazing how fast a localizer or a glide slope can slide out from under you in five seconds if you're sitting there looking for a particular checklist item. Uh, well, I mean, in, in five seconds is forever. So so recently I did a real mission, an IMC mission that was filed IFR in the system in the PA thirty two, which which I I wanted to do to challenge myself both for practice and for doing it because I needed to, because I was getting myself to Windsor to go fly the RB14 and the drive from Toronto was pretty long. So it's nice to have access to that PA32 that I helped my buddy buy and fly back home. And so now I'm on the insurance for it. It has a six pack from the seventies, autopilot from the seventies. Absolutely do not trust that autopilot in IMC. So I hand fly whenever I'm in IMC, especially climbing or turning or anything, maybe level flight. I might let it give it a shot, but we named it Stevie Wonder and and show a shot of what it looks like. It's a pretty hilarious control interface for it. So this particular mission, I knew there was a chance I'd be an IMC for the climb. The forecast was such that largely it was going to be a VMC day, but in Toronto there was ceiling was like 2000 or something scattered broken. And of course, by the time I left, it was broken and it was convective. So that was kind of interesting. Um, I ended up pretty much being almost solid overcast in it. Um, when I climbed, but so what had been happening was the, the iPad, of course, overheated on me before I got into the IMC part of the climb. And, um, my plan was to be using that as my AHARS backup because I don't want to trust the, you know, yes, it's legal. Yes. It's a certified panel, but I don't fly it often. And I like the idea of having a backup to see a nice synthetic vision AHARS, you know, that's just makes me feel warm and fuzzy. So that was my plan driving to the airport to do that flight that day knowing I was going to have that backup. Having it fail when it overheated was classic. And of course I do have my phone packed that day. That was my backup. And I was ready to pull that out and use. However, I hadn't set that up with the sentry. And I knew that that might take me, even if it took me five seconds, that's way too long as in an IMC bumpy day climb, where I also ended up being vectored more than 180 degrees, multiple vectors, because they were trying to send me out over the water initially to get south of Toronto. Correct, Yankee Hotel. I'm going to have to get you over the water here. Are you able to go over the water? At uh, I'll be able to get you at 5,000 shortly. Well, I'm not going too far over the water. Do you want me to stay far? All right, uh, I'm going to have to take you north of Toronto here then. Uh, turn left heading 030. 030, Quebec Yankee Hotel. So they, they're like, okay, well, we'll just get you north. That's fine. But it meant lots of vectors. So now I'm climbing IMC convective turbulence and six pack scan 
which which I do the Jason Miller thing. I play staying alive in my head and I'm looking at a new instrument every like, I don't know, is that more than once per second? I think it is. So the beat of staying alive, I was not going to mess with my iPhone or anything else. So the iPad on the ground overheated. I did glance down a couple times. Is it still? Yeah, no, it's still not. <laughs> it's still not happy. So I just gave, I was like, not going to use the iPad. That's that. And of course, by the time I got through that, that I leveled off and finished the vectors, it was 10 minutes worth of that kind of it was like the, the clouds parted literally when I pulled my iPad out, it's ready to go again. It was just classic. Like the entire time that I needed it, it wasn't available. And then when I didn't need it, it was like, I'm back for you. And it, it was a really perfect sort of example of like, if you're not prepared, you're going to get tested. So I thought I had done the right thing. I packed my backup, but I didn't set it up with a sentry. Uh, it's just, just for 10, those 10, the very long 10 minutes of a, of a flight without it. Oh. Yeah, so I kind of thank Baby Yoda for being there with me and bouncing on the on the glare shield there, and uh, everything calmed down. And of course, the vectors stopped. ATC stopped talking to me, and it stopped being busy. And it was I'm back in VMC conditions, and the iPad was good to go. Like it was just perfect storm of like the universe calling me out for not being ready. Yeah, I was I was wondering. You you mentioned that you were not particularly confident in the vacuum system uh in that airplane and uh i i wonder what inspired this unconfidence in the airplane <laughs> i think in general i'm not confident about vacuum systems especially from the 70s like right it's kind of amazing frankly that that stuff actually even works at all so the minute that i can get into like multiple backed up solid state ahars yes so i love it i love that it works and i use it but here's a case where i was ifr in vmc doing my thing i was using stevie wonder the uh, autopilot from 1971 to hold a heading i was assigned a heading and i set it and let it go i i set my heading indicator you know however often you do that every 10 15 minutes right for precession if people don't know what that is it's you set to your magnetic compass and then your gyroscope is driving your heading indicator which has mechanical friction and other issues that mean it ultimately drifts out so you're fundamentally if you don't keep on top of that, it's not, you're not going to be flying the heading you think you're flying. Um, and that's, uh, in this airplane, it seems to be every 10 to 15 minutes, it's out a fair bit. So on this particular flight, I let it go for a while on purpose. Cause I was like, I want to see how this goes. And so I had the, um, breadcrumbs on four flight showing this like slow arc happening. And that's the autopilot flying the heading as the heading indicator stops reading what it should be reading. So I used the ruler tool on it to be like, it's out a fair bit now. So now here's an interesting situation. I was about to fix it and then ATC gave me a new heading. So it's like, okay, so he's giving me headings based on what he sees my track doing. He thinks he's correcting for wind. So I just told him on the mic, I was like, I gotta be honest, like my heading indicator is so out right now. I'm gonna fix my precession and then refly my assigned heading and let's, let's see how that looks. <laughs> Cause I didn't want, I didn't want to do that and then fly the heading he assigned which now probably is like 20 degrees off right so those images are a good illustration of that so i just had that conversation it wasn't a busy day so i could because i wouldn't usually get into that much information over the radio but it was it was a quiet day so i just told him it's like i just let it go for 15 i was just curious how this was going to go and that's how much it processed this isn't wind correction this is this is my autopilot following the wrong course so i fixed it and then i got back to my assigned heading and he was like yeah that's you're good that's what i was gonna get you to do make it right turn 15 degrees or whatever which ultimately was what the procession fix did for me so having four flight there with the ruler tool gave me access to information that i simply would not have had um, in that panel right because i don't have a gps i don't have any other visualization of what i'm doing so this was a fun way to see it on the instrument plate or the chart like to see the ruler tool lined up with the breadcrumbs, not making a straight line with the autopilot doing its thing. Yeah, I'm sure uh, that it, that controller and every other pilot on a heading uh, appreciated uh, them not all getting wind corrections in there and being very confused <laughs> afterwards. Exactly, exactly, yeah. right? Because that's what happens. The controller makes a note when he has to give an airplane a correction thing, and I guess there's wind happening up there, right? You're talking about a DG, you know, processing over... 15 minutes, you know, if you could sit there and watch that thing and you wouldn't know that it was, you know, slowly sliding out of place there. Um, yeah. If you don't remember to look at your compass, which is sometimes hard to remember to do, 
it's it's amazing how fast it's out yeah uh i think yeah. about that you know we were talking about ahars earlier you know you had a, a directional gyro do that but you can have a gyro and an attitude indicator <sighs> well do a real nice slow procession like that and you know you're not going to notice that suddenly you're in a pretty big bank until it stops responding to you and then everything else starts telling you stuff. You're hitting indicator, yeah. and everything is like, "What?" The? Then, then you got to remember, "What am I trusting?" And you got to do your partial panel. And these are all skills we're we're capable of, but do you really want to be tested like that in the real life? Yeah, I don't. No. I don't think anybody really likes doing it on their check ride. I definitely don't like doing it on, you know, an actual flight if I don't have to. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a good thing to have in the in the airplane with you. The instrument check ride where we do it in Toronto, it does put us in a spot where everything happens so fast. The examiner even kind of said to me, you know, maybe it'd be better to plan a longer flight, but we just don't really have that opportunity in Toronto because of where it's at. So we're never not working for that ride. So um, I had to sell him on the idea of like, I'm using four flight, you know. I know some examiners either will fail it on you or tell you off the bat they don't want you using it or whatever. But I just said, here's the deal. Like, it's what I use in real life. It's what I'm going to use in real life. I have three backups. So if you fail my iPad, I'm going to pull out a backup. If you fail my backup, I'm going to pull out my phone. If you fail that, I'm going to key the mic and tell ATC I'm having a bad day and my flight's over. I want vectors. Like, I'm out of here. So that's the way it would go in real life. Like, I'm not going to try to transition to paper and continue a flight with my family on board and continue to our destination in hard IMC and fly an approach to minimums, right? That's just not safe. It's not a scenario I'm going to put myself in. I'm not a professional pilot, so I don't have to, right? I mean, maybe a professional pilot would have to have a different answer to that. But for me, I sat down right away with the examiner and laid that out. So it's like, this is my workflow. This is going to be my workflow. The airplane I did my flight test in did not have an autopilot. So I was like, I'm going to be hand flying all of this. Um, I'm going to be briefing my plate, which I put in a binder. It's not going to be hard for me to find my plates. I'm definitely not going to be flipping through paper. And I've also annotated things like my cold weather correction which i did have to do on my flight test so it's there in blue annotated text so i really laid it out for him in the pre-brief so there was no surprises and I, I said to him you know i'm prepared for you to fail it um so feel free to but that's the way it's going to play out if you do and he didn't he didn't end up he was happy with my answer and he didn't fail it on me and we did the test and it was busy and it went smoothly and I did all my work with ForeFlight as my situation awareness with my six pack as my primary nav and my, obviously that's legally what I have to use, but having that situational awareness in front of me was invaluable, right? You can't put a price on that. I was going to ask if, uh, if he ended up failing and see, you know, really testing to see if one of your, you know, one of your backups was really ready to go. Well, I showed uh, him that in the pre-brief. I, I literally pulled them all out and said, it's packed. It has the data. It's charged. And if you fail this one, here's my phone. But I'm going to be honest, if you if you try to make me do a flight test on a phone, I'm going to change what I'm doing. And I'm probably going to ask for a lot more help from ATC because that's what I would do in real life. I wouldn't pretend it was A-OK -okay situation normal because it's not. I, I think that is such a great, like, on a, on a check ride, flying like you're going to be flying in real life. Not trying to have the, you know, the ego of, oh, I can handle, you know. <clears throat> literally anything you throw at me um you know get get atc to help out on that stuff and and fly it like you're really gonna fly is that something that you had practice with your instructor of failing those devices beforehand working up to your instrument no we never really practice it because i think i just made that clear that's the way i'm going to roll it's it's i'm not carrying paper because i'm carrying my backups digitally and pack them and they're they're good to go so I never ran into the situation where my backup failed because what I wanted it for was the AHAR situation with the, that, that one day where I actually didn't care about having the backup charts so much as I cared about the backup AHARs. So that was the first time that that called me out, right? Um, on a flight test, though, I wasn't going to be using synthetic vision, so that wasn't on the table. So I wasn't even, that, you know, that's not what I'm going to be doing. So no, I didn't really practice it as much as just knew it was a thing that I was going to do. I think with your, uh, your check ride and showing the DP that you were, you know, you, you, you were prepared, everything was backed up there and everything like that, uh, it, it's probably why, why you didn't get a failure, uh, on that check ride is cause you had gone through and shown you were prepped and ready to go for all of that. Oh. You know, what he did do, which was pretty cool, which I wasn't prepared for necessarily was I'd always, and maybe I took so long to get my instrument, uh, rating that maybe in the early days we did practice this, but. 
I had not been trained to do a go around and not look up under the hood. Every, every time toward the end of the prep for the test, it was, we're going to talk about, you know, f f uh, 500 above um, minimums. I'm going to look up in 400, right? I'm going to look up a hundred feet before minimums because why would you look up the first time at minimums, right? You need to be primed and ready to go if you don't see the runway. So every time we did a practice approach, I'd be looking up hundred feet before minimums, which of course it's not, we're not actually in minimums. I'm, I'm under the hood or whatever. So I see the runway and we proceed to then just do a, whatever. This is a training flight. We're not really going to land. So we do a go around anyway, practice, go around all good on the flight test. And it, he didn't brief me on this until we were on the approach and I know why he did it, but it was pretty cool. So I did that thing where I said, okay, so 500 to go, I'm going to look up in 400. So this is literally at 500 to go on the ILS approach. And he says to me, Actually on this one, don't look up because you're not going to see the ground you're in. It's below minimums, So don't look up. And I was like, I had the 300 feet worth of further descent to realize he just did this because he wants to see me do a go around under the hood. And I'm flying a PA 30 or a PA 28, which requires me to bend down a fair bit there to grab that flap handle. And then I'm going to change to a climb and ex you know, all that stuff's going to happen with the vestibular thing. So I had like, now I'm like 200 feet to go. So I'm quickly like telling myself all that stuff I know about physiologically what's going to happen because I have not practiced this. So I'm going to feel weird. I think probably. Right. And I tried not to reach down too far. Cause I knew if I did that thing with my head, it might get weird. And sure enough. Oh my God, I'm pretty good with motion sickness. Like I'm laying on knock on wood, whatever. I don't have these problems, but that one, all of it happened. I felt a little bit nauseous. I felt like, I think I remember thinking I'm descending and turning right, I think is what I felt. But my instruments are like, nope, you're climbing straight, just like you think you are. So I got real quiet and didn't say, and I, I usually verbalize everything I'm doing, especially on a flight, even when I'm alone, but definitely on the flight test, I wanted him to know everything I was doing. So there was no guessing if I was prepared or thinking through things. I got real quiet. <laughs> I just did that go around, stayed real quiet, fought the, the physiological effects that were happening. And it was, uh, it was an interesting moment. And, and that's part of the reason too, why for instrument flying, I like the uh, iPad as close as possible to the eye line. Cause there's so many situations where I have to put it on my kneeboard. Like the Harvard, for instance, is such a massive airplane, but there is nowhere to put it. Like I can't stick it to the canopy or it'll be in my face. So, um, but I'm not flying IFR in that thing. So that's fine. But anything I'm flying IFR for, for where the iPad goes, it needs to be near the eye line or you risk those vestibular issues if you're in IMC. So even for the, for the RV, I don't have a place to mount it like a, a yoke. Still kind of locking in how I want to do that in there. So I've got, I've used a suction mount to just kind of place it where I think I want it. And I'm going to probably just epoxy one of those Ram balls about, about that location of the canopy rail so that I can put it in a good spot that doesn't block my Lindbergh reference, which I think is a Jason Miller term, which I like, because especially in the RV, when I'm in the three point attitude, I'm fully blind forward. So I'm totally using my pie slice trick. If you guys know what that is for any airplane, mm -hmm. when you're blind in the front, pretty much once you dial in, you got two pie slices that are the same. You just pick the, what typically for me is the left one. And that's kind of what I'm looking at. Well, I figured out because you can tell if it's getting smaller, you're going left, it's getting bigger, you're going right. And you can get all your information about alignment and height with that, with that bit of visual data. But if you put an iPad there, you, you don't have that. So, um, I got a good spot dialed in for the iPad for the RV, which keeps it in my eye line. So I can brief plates and, and stuff, which I think I'm, even though I could theoretically do it on the panel, I just like it. It's just the way I've done it. And I don't see why I would change that, you know? So that's, that's going to be my work workflow in that airplane for IFR. Is there, is, is there anything that you're using? You mentioned like annotating plates, uh, previously. And, and I'm wondering about that, you know, that, that, uh, Coriolis illusion, uh, missed approach that you were having there. Was there anything that you had done, uh, that you thought worked really well on, you know, briefing your missed approach that kept you, you know, headed in the right direction or, or anything that you'd want to change on that? Honestly, I mean, I think, I think what I liked about it was, was that I did it right and it worked. Um, I think it's, it's kind of a function of the piper that required me to reach down for that flap handle. That's, that's what did it. I, I, I knew that would be the problem. So, I just have to reach the floor for that flap handle in that airplane. So doing a go around in IMC, you know, how, how, how often is that going to happen? Probably not very often, but there it is that that's, that's the gotcha, at least in that particular airplane. So I wouldn't run into that in the RV. Like I got, I got my flap control on the stick 
or I've got it on the panel that I can just easily reach for. The only thing I have to reach down for in the RV is the fuel selector, and I'm sure as heck not going to be doing that during a go around. So, um, yeah, it, it, you just need to be aware that that'll happen. So do it, everything you can to mitigate that risk, which is why I want the iPad in my eye line for IFR. Thanks. Yeah, my my tailwheel time is all in Cetabria, uh, where I don't quite have quite as reliance on you know looking for uh, looking for that Lindbergh reference out the side. Like I. I have you can a see. significant amount extra out the front of the airplane yeah. uh, there. I, I wonder that transition to tailwheel, um, is that, how was that transition from, you know, tricycle to tail? And uh, I, I see you flying tailwheel, uh, it seems a lot more regularly, uh, after, you know, getting the, the, the RV. Uh, do you prefer that type of flying and landing to tricycle gears? Yeah, I mean, definitely, I love it. It definitely, like I said, getting to the Super Cub felt like home to me as as far as that was my primacy. That was my first flying experience. Having been a kid, always wanting to fly, getting to do it in an in a old beat up old Schweitzer 233, which fundamentally is a tailwheel airplane. I mean, it only has two wheels, right? The one main wheel and then the tailwheel. So jumping in the Super Cub felt like that and, and just really makes you work the rudder. I've done a few talks for like different groups, like the Mooney group, for instance. And it was interesting to hear how many pilots, like I started the talk asking how many of you fly tailwheel, how many of you think you need it and how many of you think you don't. And the number of people that didn't think they needed it was interesting, but the guys who had it looked at them and kind of had that knowing look like, meh, it'll make you a better Mooney pilot. <laughs> Even if you don't think it will. Yeah. Just, I, as a, as a commercial pilot, I thought I knew how to fly airplanes until I became an instructor, and I realized that I, I, I didn't know anything about flying airplanes uh, beforehand. And I thought I, you know, as a tricycle pilot, I thought I knew how to use the rudder in the airplane. And then hopping in the Cetabria, I learned that I didn't know anything about how you like how to use the rudder correctly uh, in there. And so I, I, I'm glad to see that that's not just me in the airplane. It's a little more universal. Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, it's it's so. And so, and I guess this kind of type of flying has really lent itself to everything else that, uh, it's, it's, I don't have a lot of time as a weekend warrior dude, but I am able to jump into new stuff and I'm pretty good at knowing what I need to do to make it work as far as I don't necessarily need to know, um, have a lot of time in the airplane in the sense that I can quickly dial it in because I think I've had to jump in and out of so many things so quickly that I quickly noticed the feedback loop of what did I do? What was the outcome of that control input movement? Um, so, you know, for instance, flying the DA-62, I did one familiarization flight before I went to do that mission and then flew left seat the whole time. And the dude I was flying with was like, cool, you're doing it all. I mean, that first landing showed me. So I've got footage of him like starting to do the paperwork while I'm in the round out. <laughs> like he's like that trusting of me right and this is some i think one of them was a pretty challenging landing to greenland where the, the wind was pretty good i think on the approach i said to him this is a lot more crosswind than i expected based on what i'm doing to adjust for the crosswind short final and he, he kind of laughed he's like yeah it's always like that here and he's grabbing his clipboard off the glare shield and starting to write down the numbers of like he's like checked out as far as being off <laughs> it's like okay so i mean the tailwheel flying definitely puts me in a place where I'm not likely to land a DA-62 with side load and I'm probably going to hit the center line because I know I need to type of thing. Like I'm, I'm much more disciplined about those things that maybe some 172 drivers can get lazy about because they can get away with it. So it definitely, it helps to remind me like the tight margin is, is what you want to target and it keeps it tight and accurate. Yeah. I, 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 I had to decouple my aileron input and my rudder input um that they are related they are not linked together uh those no. are those need to be the correct input separately uh to do what you need the airplane to do um from from tailwheel i think that's a great you know segue to the a very different non-tailwheel airplane of a, a brand new 62 uh across mm -hmm. the atlantic um and i i wonder can you kind of set us up to how you got started on that flight and sort of what your mission was. Yeah. I mean, so way back before COVID, we started talking about that and I was going to do some training with them and, and do my multi IFR, which I don't still have in Canada. We can do VFR multi. Um, and, and so I did that. So I got my multi rating, but I'm not instrument rated in the multi 
and did my, my single engine instrument. So I was going to connect those dots and then do the multi with diamond and do some training. And then COVID happened and all that stuff got shelved. So I missed a whole season of possibly doing that with them. And even for them, the ferry flying got shut down for a time because Greenland stopped accepting any arrivals. So it's like, well, we can't do it because they have to stop in Greenland. Right. So when that picked back up, they're like, well, do you want to do this backwards? Because the goal was to have started by doing the multi IFR training with them, have lots of familiarity with the instrument and the airplane, and then go do this crazy, awesome, ridiculous mission. So I was like, yeah, well, I don't want to not do it. I don't want to say no to that opportunity, but I don't want to show up unprepared. So this kind of put me in this interesting spot where I had to do a lot of work in the front end to get ready. But then it was also a lot of winging it, honestly, um, because I just couldn't, there's certain things I couldn't prepare for it, like what we talked about. It did go smoothly. So that was pretty cool. Um, but at the end of the day, it was, it was a really neat experience to watch these. So the way it worked was I was flying with the chief pilot basically from diamond in Austria and one of the new kind of flight line crew members, Mickey was flying a DA 42 behind us that was also being ferried. So whatever the requirement was of spacing, I guess he was like 10 minutes behind us the whole way. And it was a really neat process to watch the planning happen for these two airplanes and, and how we executed trying to stay together and, and treating him as the weakest link because he didn't have de-icing capability. So we had to really think that through. And at any given time, if we were picking up ice, we're, we're, we're both going to turn back type thing. Um, so yeah, it was just a lot to watch how they did it and, and try to pay attention to this massive flight plan. But it was also interesting that at the end of the day, it still is the same process. It's just a bunch of legs that you plan the way you plan. It's just that you have to be in an emergency suit flying over a lot of nothing in the middle of the Atlantic for a while where you can't even talk to anybody unless you use a sat phone or low, low what is it? The, uh, we weren't using the low frequency radio cause we had sat phone. And, and what was really cool was the nav logs for four flight. So shout out to four flight and even Martin, the, the chief pilot that I was flying with remarked like organically about that. Like he would show me like, check this out. These are the printed nav logs that he was using to check his fuel burn and, and, and checkpoints and so on. As we said on the report, and the fuel is 65 remaining and we should have 65 remaining wow huh? this is four flight yeah, yeah. see that's pretty cool the, the, yeah it's been amazing to watch these numbers line up yeah love that they were lining up like to the minute and to the gallon amazing yeah that's uh i you've got you've got me i don't have any time uh as the pilot over water like that and i i think that is all you could ever ask for in that situation is that your planning is is coming out to meet reality there. Right. So. I mean, it, it was interesting is they do have a lot of range, but it's it's still this thought that what if the winds or what if something changed, you know, just to have this confidence that the flight plan worked and it dialed into that accuracy. So it really created a pretty relaxed situation short of now we're in a twin. Some people saw fo photos of us like, why are you guys wearing emergency suits in a twin? It's like, eh. Why not? Ocean, ocean's <laughs> pretty we all, cold. Uh... We also had a raft. It's like, I don't know. It's possible to have two engine failures. I mean, or whatever. I don't know. But that was their rules. Like, that's just a non-starter. We're, we're wearing the emergency suits if we if we go across that much water. So that was it. We had the raft. We had all that stuff. We briefed all that stuff that we were going to do. Um, that was probably the biggest fear of all of it. If anyone asked me what was your what were you most nervous about with that, it was like that and and to be honest my second biggest fear was my bladder <laughs> i feel like i watched these guys kind of prep and talk about how they get how they work that out and the whole the, the way they keep themselves hydrated without having to pee but we did have the like uh the embarrassing option of like peeing into like a diaper type thing it's got like that gel pack type material so the option was there right if you have to use it but no one wants to be that guy <laughs> so i managed to do it i just followed what they did it's like no tea or coffee before departure minimum amounts of water to keep yourself hydrated, but don't be chugging. And uh, the longest leg I think we did was 4.5 hours. So it was manageable, but uh, yeah, it just, uh, it, it was like clockwork. Honestly, it was amazing to be a part of that. And I've got a zillion hours of footage to uh, sort out. It's nice. so much stuff between both airplanes. Cause Mickey was also rolling three GoPros cause he's kind of pretty good on social media. So tons of four flight usage, just really cool to watch how it happened both both of them using it in different ways um so i'll be intercutting between the two airplanes for those missions and it's lots of great learning to share is that a was is that your longest cross country 
Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> kind of, it's, it's hard to go uh, anywhere longer without also crossing the ocean there. Oh. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, because even doing something in North America, I don't know that I would ever feel like it would be that kind of a mission because at any given time, especially in the States, you can literally pick an airport in some cases like in five miles, right? Yeah. So it's it's never that feeling of like, here we go. We're launching on a pretty big leg here and like we got to make some decisions about when, when do we consider turning back if we have to and all that sort of stuff. Is there is there anything from that planning or, or flying that you thought, oh, I, I got to take that back to even my regular cross countries? Uh, like that that's the way to do things? I think really it just came down to the SOPs of treating it as if it's just a normal mission. You know, you do the big picture briefing. I think I like Jason Miller's approach to thinking through that stuff where he, he what does he call it, cherry picking or something like that? Where you kind of start off by like, just, eh, I don't know, check this, check that. See if you can find a reason not to go first, right? And then if you can't find a reason not to go, now you go into the whole like, okay, it looks good. Let's actually do this. And and watching how those guys did it, we I filmed the first briefing we did together, which was a solid hour. I got all of it on camera. I don't know how much I'm going to use because it's just so much. But we sat through it. We planned it. We talked about the whole route. Here's the gotchas. Here's things to watch out for. Um, you know, we're going to look at no tams again tomorrow type thing, but you know, here's the big picture weather. Now we'll see what might change. We know this is a concern here about possible icing there. Um, but yeah, their workflow was, was pretty much the way that I've been sort of taught to do it. It was interesting to see them do it. And it's like small or big trip, you know, once you're going a certain distance away from home, you kind of got to do all of these steps to be sure you got yourself covered. Yeah. I, th I think, uh, you know, it just being a, a regular flight is definitely how you keep yourself from, you don't psych yourself up thinking, you know, oh, this is, this is the critical mission here. I got, I got to get this right. Um, you just, you fly like you normally fly, uh, as you go through. Yeah. I think the biggest difference was, was I don't always fly with that much survival gear or whatever, that kind of a thing. And I had a PLB like stuck to my body, which, you know, th there's a schools of thought about the idea that you pretty much need what you need to be connected to your body. Cause if you have to get out in a hurry, you're going to watch your survival kit burn or sink. So we, yeah, that, so we briefed that even simply like you're grabbing the raft, I'm grabbing the kit and we're not letting go of the tether if we have to get out. So adding those additional things aren't something I do every flight, <laughs> but you know, so maybe there's like a, a checklist item that says mission specific items here. Right. And then that's where you're like, okay, so this mission is crossing the Atlantic. So here's, what we're thinking about today that we don't think about tomorrow. Cause once we leave from a Callowit across Northern Canada, that's a different deal. We're not going over water, but we're going over some pretty inhospitable terrain. Yeah. When, uh, when we, you know, winter time in North Dakota, we were very equipment on you. Uh, you fly in boots, you know, you know you're flying in your jacket. It is not yeah, always no flip flops. Yeah, no, no flip flops. It's not. It's not my preferred attire for flying, but it's my preferred attire for uh, if anything were to happen to the airplane. Uh, and I like having that all on me. Um, one thing that I think is interesting, you bring all of that equipment on board, is how that affects affects your loading of the aircraft, uh, particularly on on things like cross countries and stuff. Um, you just brought in, you know, the RV to Oshkosh, and you know, I you must have brought some stuff to go around Oshkosh for a week in the airplane. You know, how do, how do you get all of that fit in and make sure that you're comfortable with the balance of that airplane? So that was my first cross country, right? Cause we, we, we really put it to the limit of getting that airplane done. And so we had just gotten the paperwork to leave the 25 mile radius. Like I think not even, I don't even think it was 36 hours before I had to launch for that trip. So I did one local flight, to just some other airport further away from than 25 miles, just so I could land it at a different runway before the next day of going to Osh. And I flew with Blake who owns that uh, PA 32. He was my uh, safety pilot for that mission. He's not tailwheel and you know, he had no time in RVs or anything. So he was really just there to kind of be my second set of eyes and brains, which I appreciated. And so I had his personal stuff, my personal stuff and my professional stuff, which is a fair amount of equipment, right? Like, I mean, I try to travel light, but my kit is my kit and there's a lot of camera gear and computer gear and so on. So I weighed everything individually. So I knew I wasn't going to exceed the hundred pound limit of the airplane and laid it out. And it was so much stuff. I just couldn't believe it was going to fit. And I still started doubting myself about the weight even. 
but yeah, I mean, I used the four flight weight and balance feature just to kind of give myself that extra confidence and sure enough, it did fit and it didn't even stack past the top of the seats. So we could have gone higher to the windows if we needed to for more bulk. Um, so with Blake and I were both not exactly big guys and lots of fuel, we still had room. So it was pretty cool to test the RV in that scenario to uh, do a real mission. Pretty cool to have, we had it at the Garmin booth there. So it was a pretty exciting spot to have it. And uh, yeah, it, it was, it, you know, and again, flying with four flight, having, having that additional, so with the weather, that's what I was using largely was to have the Sentry doing that for me. And, and also the panel has that information from uh, Sirius XM. So we were super covered, felt good. So some people have said, how do you deal with this information overload? And it's like, you prioritize what you want. So um, if I'm gonna brief a plate, I'm gonna do it right there on the iPad, boom, done. Yes, I can do it on the panel if I press a bunch of buttons and bring it up and zoom it in or whatever, but I don't, I haven't practiced that. So that's not gonna be what I'm gonna do on the first mission to fly to air venture in the airplane. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's, it's all about balancing what you got and using it efficiently so that you're not melting your brain. And I mean, going back to that idea of that week where I came back from the Atlantic crossing, flew the A62, the RV, the T6 and the PA32, totally different panels, totally different workflows all within a couple of days of each other. And the one day I flew the RV and the Harvard back to back and took a buddy. And I, I said to him at the beginning of the first flight, which was in the Harvard, having not flown that in a while, I was like, this, I'm not expecting good landings today. So just be ready for that <laughs> because the eye to ground height is so different. Amazingly, I did okay. like the both landings. He was like, wow, they, you know, it was amazing. I don't know if I'll be able to duplicate that again, jumping in between both airplanes back to back, but it's just the idea of managing workflow such that you're using what you need, you're preparing yourself. And I did, I did some hardcore preparing myself before I did that, that jumping in between both airplanes that same day. We flew there in his 182 and on the way there, I, I reviewed my Harvard cheat sheet because I knew I needed to remember the numbers because I'm flying the RV a lot and it's different, very different feel, very different performance and ironically similar numbers in terms of speeds. Um, not top speed, but climb is 95 in both airplanes and VREF is 85 in both airplanes pretty much. So that, that was cool to have that be the same, but fundamentally that, it's, it's go ahead. I think that like not only in every airplane that you're flying, but outside of the airplane as well, you know, you, you, you sitting, you know, sitting there in the 182 sit, you know, briefing stuff in there. Uh, it's not like you had access to the T6 panel. Uh, you know, or the T6 to, to go through and do everything. Uh, but thanks to having it all on the iPad there, you, you've got all that outside of the aircraft uh, a, as well. And, and I think that that makes it so much easier. You're talking about, you know, briefing always on the iPad. You know, I, if I've got a PFD, that's, that's what I'm using to maintain straight and level and navigate off of and fly off of because it's my installed equipment in there. And I don't really want to mess with anything that's on that panel because I've got it set up to do its job exactly how I want it to do its job. Uh, you know, with the iPad, I can brief, I can, you know, look at different views, I can move things around and uh, I, I don't have to worry about messing up what I've got set uh, in my aircraft. Makes my scan easy, makes everything a lot, a lot nicer for me. So. Yeah. And one of the good questions I got asked on social media is uh, something else that I do a lot of is fly airplanes that I'm not qualified on and essentially get a, you know, introductory flight in some crazy different thing. Right. So I'm flying with someone that I maybe don't, don't even know, like I met them the first time or something when I show up for this thing in an airplane I have not got access to for dry time. And maybe I got to look at the panel in a picture. So the question was, have you ever, so do you have SOPs that you do in those situations or you do, do you just completely uh, trust the pilot? I'm going to always, require that um, I'm part of the checklist process. So typically I ask for the list in advance so I can review it. And then when we're doing it, it does sometimes happen that things are a little crazy, whatever, we're flying somewhere like AirVenture or something like that. So I'm gonna be missing some of the pre-flight or some of the check initial checks because I'm literally like rigging cameras, like, well, they're starting up, you know? So stuff like that'll happen. But one experience I had, I won't mention names, but it was a pretty complex twin. That was the thing. I was doing my thing, setting up stuff. He did his pre-flight and we launched and I was at the controls because that's how we're doing it. So we're both eyes out because, you know, you got a new person at the controls. Neither one of us did a good job with the airspeed alive check. We're airborne, airspeed not alive. What do you think happened? 
Yeah, that not not a good flight. Uh, I'm guessing you got a pedo uh, cover sitting over there. Uh, uh-huh. with a nice big red flag on it. <laughs> yeah, flapping in the wind as we climbed out. Well, it's been great going through and sort of chatting about some of your your history and lessons learned and flying and everything of all of these different aircraft. Uh, we're going to try and get to as many questions as we can here today, but. You had posted out on social media uh, to some of your Patreons uh, what kind of things they wanted to hear about in this webinar. And so we'd love to run through some of those questions and uh, hear kind of your take on that. Yeah. So what I did was I posted on social some questions or I posted that we were going to do this talk and the the concept of just how to create familiarity in unfamiliar cockpits. Got a lot of questions. I built a lot of the notes into what we tried to talk about already. So we address most of them, but sort of one, this, this question talking about the added distraction potential. And he's had some op- awkward situations where he's tapped the, some wrong thing in the iPad. Um, and then been sort of tripping over it. Whereas a paper chart wouldn't do that. I think at the end of the day, my advice is don't try to learn for flight in the cockpit. <laughs> so, I'm, you know what I mean? So I'm familiar enough with it where if that were to happen, I know quickly how to get back out to the menu I wanted or something because I know the app. So if you're in a situation where you don't know the app well enough, then you shouldn't be using it primarily, if that makes sense. I think the the airplane is a pretty terrible classroom. Uh, and the biggest benefit of it being, you know, for flight being on an iPad is you don't need to be in the airplane to learn how to go right. through and do all of that. Uh, and there's a lot of great resources as far as connecting to, to Sims. Uh, be that infinite flight or your computer or any of the other tools out there Um, and learning how to to go through and navigate both your iPad and for flight so that it's not it's not an issue if something gets you know brought up on the wrong tab or anything like that you know how to get to what you're looking for uh, right away yeah bottom line dry fly the iPad just like I've been dry flying the T6 or whatever like before I flew that airplane I sat in the hangar it's the same thing with with the iPad. You can sit at home and just do practice scenarios. And again, with the sim, you can set it up and actually fly. Uh, I got to admit that I did my flight test that way. A lot of practice. The hand flying the sim is terrible, but uh, that's not what I was practicing. I just literally went and flew basically the route that I knew I was probably going to fly for my flight test and just went through the muscle memory of now is when I would brief my plate. Now is when I would think about my hold entry. Now is when I'd be looking at the chart for whatever this information or getting the frequencies up for for you know, ATIS and so on. And now is when I'm thinking about switching over to the RNAV and I got to remember to call the traffic frequency to let them know I'm five minutes out from starting my approach. So I did all that with the iPad right in front of me and with the SIM, not even worried about hand flying it. I used the autopilot in the SIM actually knowing I didn't have one on the flight test because that's not what I'm practicing here. What I'm practicing is muscle memory of my process, which is my brain kind of thinking through when am I doing what? And again, that's why it's cool that ForeFlight gives you the ATIS, right? So even if you've forgotten your in-range check, that's going to remind you to do it. So you won't be caught out. Like now I'm racing to do my in-range check when I'm already super close. Yeah. Nobody likes to get the tower question of, uh, you know, do you have ATIS? ATIS. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, be like, oh yeah, 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 I got that ATIS here. Uh, Yeah. Guess the letter. It's only one in 26 chance of getting that, right? There was questions about irregular placement of instruments. How do I deal with that? I think, you know, we've, a lot of it is just about not being stuck with muscle memory of expecting to look a certain place. Like it's just going to be different. So, uh, I just prepare myself when I get in the airplane, just take a deep breath, look at the sight picture, how I'm sitting on the ground. This is how it's going to look when I land. A lot of times it's blind <laughs> and just got to kind of think how high am I? So I don't hit the ground early. Cause that's, I mean, it's hard to say what's worse in like an airplane like the T6 if you flare early and drop it on or if you hit the ground before you expect to. <laughs> Those are both bad. <laughs> um, the dropping it on is if you drop it on straight, you're kind of okay. It's just hard. But if you drop it on with side load, that is going to be a bad day because that's a 6,000 pound tail dragger and it's going to want to, the tail's going to want to pass you if you drop it on with, you know, with a side load. So getting that picture, that sight picture figured out. And, and then same with the instruments, I'm going to just run through. I'm going to be looking at airspeed here. I'm going to be looking at RPM there. And that's kind of what's really important. And the rest of it, just kind of just from practice, it's going to come to you. Another question was about SOPs across types. That's a hard one, but fundamentally gumps almost always works in everything. 
you just got to add stuff to like, you know, S for me is switches and security. So it's my last thing on Gumps. So are my switches where I want them? And that means I got to check all my switches, including my fuel valve and so on. And am I secure? Is my passenger secure? Is the hood open? Or like in the Harvard, for instance, you can land with the hood fully closed or fully open, but not half. Because if you have a bad landing and you bend the rail, you're not going to be able to open it. And then you're, you're not, well, you can't move it. So that means you can't get out because you got this rail in front of you. Whereas if it's all the way closed or all the way open, you can get out because when it's closed, you can knock out the pain with your elbow is the theory. It's supposed to be able to knock it out. So um, that's kind of gumps almost always works in everything. And I guess, you know, same with like cigars for pre-takeoff and so on. Um, you, you definitely want to have your proper lists, but these kind of quick ones can help catch you out. Like if you do gumps three times in the pattern, which I do every single time, I would like to say I'm not going to be one of those people that I, I know there's a saying that says you there's pilots that have and pilots that will land gear up. I'd like to think I'm not going to be a guy that's going to land gear up unless I have a gear failure and I know what's going to happen um, because I do gumps three times every time including short final. It's a quick one, right? It's super easy to do it. Short final, quick gumps. Yes, gear is still down. We're, and, and also, do I have my landing clearance? That's kind of one of them, which, which I kind of line that one up security. So that's, that's kind of across all types. Another question was steam or glass? <laughs> glass. <laughs> I mean, uh, I like that I learned in steam. I don't think it's easy to go the other way, but I can't comment on that because I just didn't. But I think learning in glass and then going back to steam would be real hard. So learning in steam, going to glass, I now see how lucky we are to have glass. So I would never choose to go. Like, it's nice to have the PA-32, which again, I, I did that mission with Baby Yoda and had fun flying IMC, bouncing around by myself to do this mission, but to have my dog and my kid and my wife in the plane, that would not have been a fun day. So no. Yeah. The, um, the, the six pack always seems like it sort of feels like flying in the aerobatic airplane. Like it's really fun to do when you want to go out and do that mission and everything like that and, and fly it around. But like when you, it's yeah. not the airplane you take, it's not the panel you take, uh, when you absolutely need to get where you're going, uh, in there, you, you, no. Go with something a little bit more robust. <laughs> yeah, it's a good challenge to say you can do it. And again, I'm considering doing my IPC in Blake's plane to have the conversation with the examiner and show him the picture of my RV14 panel and say, this is what I'm going to work toward. Let's go do it in this thing and see how it goes. <laughs> because like, it, it'll be a fun experience and experiment to like hand fly the IPC, but no, it's not going to be what I'm going to do in real life. Uh, another question is about proficiency between all these types. I have a personal rule of three landings in 30 days, uh, the museum where we fly the fleet and that's where the RV is based and that we're applying the same flying orders to them. The rule is 60 days. If you have not landed the airplane three times in 60 days, you are not current. So you're going to go fly with someone else and just get yourself warmed up before you go solo. Um, so personally I try for 30 days and that means when I get to 40, at least I feel like I'm better than 60. <laughs> I do feel like 60 is a lot, especially in a plane like the T6 again. So when I did go fly with my buddy in the 182 that day, I did go fly with one of the local pilots first and go do my three patterns. Cause my, I said to him, I'll take you in the T6 provided that I don't scare myself when I go fly with uh, one of the other guys first. So it actually went really well. So I was like, oh cool, I didn't scare myself. This is good. We're gonna, we'll cause I was good. I was definitely gonna take him flying in the RV-14. I was like, I just can't promise you the T6 ride because I'm still uh, at this point, it's scary to say I've got like more than 50 hours and more than 100 landings PIC in that thing. That's pretty awesome. But I still definitely treat that airplane with tons of respect. It's there, not something to take lightly. Is there anything other than landings that you uh, <laughs> you, you add for currency in there? Uh, uh, well, yeah. I mean, the thing is, because of the nature of what it takes to get into the pattern and do it, you, you typically go through most of what you need to do. But this is a good point. We also do have um, annual flight reviews that we do at the museum, which is essentially a flight test where we fly with one of the other guys and go through every single thing from forest approach, stalls, slow flight, all of it. So we do that annually with every single airplane in the fleet. Um, I don't typically do um, stalls too, too often, uh, especially in the T6, because just I'm, I'm fairly good at it, but you don't want to spin that thing less than like 5,000 feet. So it's not common that I want to bother going that high. I do practice forest approaches though, probably 
maybe once every three or four flights. So that'll still put me about once a quarter. I'll be practicing. I just want to remind myself like this thing comes to the air like a tank. Um, and th that does also relate to how I fly patterns. I'm very tight in the pattern in those airplanes because you don't want to be losing the engine over a neighborhood. That's not going to go well. So sometimes the uh, ATC is pretty good in Windsor where the museum is based at not extending our patterns, but sometimes they'll say, you know, whatever, you're number three, uh, extend the downwind, I'll call your base, that'll happen. I will usually go to key the mic and then before I ask for it, they're like, actually, you want to do a 360 there? I'm like, uh-huh. <laughs> so I'll sit there and do a 360 at the base to, or the downwind to base turn because that's at any given time here, I can just hit it and get back to the field. I don't want to be flying pattern altitude two miles away or three miles away, whatever. I'm typically doing a half mile final in those things. And you can do the same thing in the RV, it works. So I like flying that way. Yeah, um, I, avoid I, being I, I like that. I, I don't like being miles away from the airport with uh, no altitude to play with. So. Yeah, no, no fun. So um, how do you f avoid being distracted by the cockpit? This is another question when it's unfamiliar it's the same thing if, if you're if you're unfamiliar do the best you can to get familiar so that you're not looking for stuff that's the worst feeling so that's partly why i like four flight there avionics are typically not a thing i'm dealing with to be honest like unless i really need to be i'm just i'm flying it i'm looking at airspeed altitude controls i'm not programming flight plans into this thing that i'm not familiar with a dynan or whatever it's going to be that's this airplane i'm not that familiar with I <laughs> just use four flight. It's going to work great. So I just keep it familiar, keep it simple. Don't add tasks that I don't need to worry about. Um, the negative transfer question came up. It's my cheat sheet. Typically every airplane I fly has a cheat sheet with the most important points for procedures, speeds. And I just read it to myself several times and maybe sit there and like fly a pattern or whatever in my head or what I did in that day in the 182. I just ran through my Harvard cheat sheet. Um, someone asks, how is it not unsafe <laughs> to fly this many types? And it's like, it is unsafe. So, um, I have these systems to mitigate the risk. And then the question came up about the, do you just go along with the other pilot? And no, not anymore. Like I changed that. So I, I definitely make sure we watch the pre-flight and checklists for educational purposes. And also, so I'm a second set of eyes, even if it's not a type that I fly just so there's no chance that, cause I think something I, I underestimate is, and I, I do have this conversation before I do any video with anybody is like, you are going to see the rough cut. I'm not going to just publish this. So don't worry about it. If something stupid happens or something embarrassing or just anything, like just whatever, we're going to, we're going to work through this cut together to make sure we like what we publish. So I don't want them thinking about that stress if I'm on camera. But it still happens where people get nervous and they, they, they're either trying to impress me or they're just trying to make themselves look better for whatever on YouTube. My whole thing has been, there's a lot of cool pilots out there. You know, flight chops is not about being cool. It's about just the joke of like, I don't even have a strong chin. Like, why would I do this to myself? Like I used to grow a full beard. <laughs> the whole mustache is a joke. So it's really about just being kind of self-deprecating while I try to get better and debrief and share those honest, authentic moments of learning and improving. So anytime I fly with someone else, I try to remove that stress from them about the cameras. Like it's there for debrief. Let's just remember that, you know, we're going to tell a cool story probably here, but at the end of the day, we're probably also going to find some nuggets that we didn't know we were going to get. And that's where the best stuff happens because it's organic and natural. We are now going to jump into some Q and a here. Um, uh, first question here for Steve. Um, looking back when you were low hours, how and what would you consider using ForeFlight from what you know today? Well, I mean, I've learned a lot about the procedural usages. And obviously, in the early days, I wasn't instrument rated. So, and then, of course, watching what's cool is ForeFlight updates literally monthly, right? So, so much richness has come to the app since I even started using it. Like in the early days, it didn't have weight and balance integrated when I started, for instance. So it really is the the beginning of the flight planning process at home and then bring it to the cockpit. And I guess the whole press a button and send it to the panel also is new, right? Like that, that wasn't always a thing. So not knowing all the avionics is, is not necessarily required because you can send your flight plan right to the panel and almost get away with not touching the interface of the navigator, right? So I think just usage has evolved so much that it's not even 
it's, it's hard to even answer that question because of the context. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, next question also for you here. Uh, what's your biggest lesson overall? <laughs> that is a yeah, big question. It's a big one. I think we tried to address it. I think at the end of the day, this whole thing was trying to we covered a lot of ground and try to keep bringing Forflight in as that touchstone of familiarity because I do a lot of different stuff and the whole idea of is it is it safe to constantly be on the ragged edge of barely on top of what you're doing, right? Like so trying to bring as much familiarity as I can to any situation to mitigate the unknowns. So I think for me it's been slow down, be prepared and uh you know try to minimize the amount of confusion that is inevitably going to happen anyway <laughs> so that's probably been the biggest lesson really is just workflow and sops got it uh next question here for thomas uh when using forflight on an ipad with cel cellular capabilities do you have to have it connected to a server for the gps and maps on forflight to work yeah, I think it's a good question. Uh, the reason that we recommend that cellular iPad is because it has the built-in GPS chip. Uh, we don't actually need to use the cellular capabilities of the iPad. Uh, it just has a separate chip in there. That being said, like you can use a cellular iPad to file flight plans and do things that you might use an internet connection for, um, where you don't have a good internet connection at, say, an FBO or on the ramp. Uh, but you definitely don't want to have to rely on that in flight. And that's where tools like PAC uh, and making sure that you've pre-briefed all of your charts and plates inside of ForeFlight is really going to help out. Um, so you don't need it to be connected to any kind of server for the GPS uh, that own ship to show up. Um, it could be a helpful tool if you're in places with not a good internet connection, um, but you don't want to rely on that. You want to make sure you've got all that stuff downloaded, ready to go before you get out to the aircraft. Yeah, good answer. Moving on with the next question here uh, for Steve again. Uh, have you done IFR flying throughout your cockpit hopping or only or only doing that in a single plane? Right, so that kind of relates to the other question of, of the whole connectivity issue and just having all the data with you. Because at the end of the day, the iPad is largely my touchstone for IFR plate briefing, flight planning, the whole thing, and even my AHARS backup. So. Um, I've been lucky to have so many experiences in like that one week, for instance, obviously I'm not flying IFR in the T6 and we just recently got the RV14 IFR certified, which is a separate step in Canada, but I've been kind of thinking through the procedures, even when I'm flying VFR in it, just kind of thinking about how, how is this workflow going to go? And then of course that, that, that one week I had just come back from Austria in the DA62, which was an entirely uh, instrument filed flight. And flying myself to Windsor was IFR in the PA32 with that whole different panel. So yeah, that's that's a challenge, right? It's like cockpit hopping, instrument flying, and how do you keep the consistency workflow SOPs to stop yourself from tripping over something or just making some silly mistake because you are dealing with different buttonology and different procedures. You know, quite literally, like flying the uh, the PA32, I can't accept the GPS waypoint clearance, right? So I'll file standard equipment, and then controllers will inevitably change the flight plan and try to give me a waypoint, and I always have to say unable because I can't technically accept a clearance to a waypoint um, because I don't have GPS officially as part of my flight plan. So, yeah, for flight is essentially my kind of foundation when I do bounce around between things that are, I mean, that's kind of what this whole talk was about is, is trying to minimize and mitigate the risks and uh, stress in, in terms of jumping between things. And then of course, if I'm not comfortable or unfamiliar, I'll take a pilot for a safety pilot or I'll do some training. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, another question here. Do you carry a Stratus with you? So there is, uh, I have a Sentry now in my bag, which I, I think as far as I understand it, it's just a newer version of what the Stratus can do, right? Is that correct? It's just smaller. Yeah, it's 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 smaller, it's lighter, and it does have the carbon monoxide. So lighter, it has more, is, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, so that's always in my bag, and I pull it out. Well, for instance, it's going to be in the PA32 all the time. I don't necessarily use it in the RB14 just because of how much equipment I've already got in there, and that cockpit is tight. So if I don't need it in there, I'm not necessarily going to use it in there. In the T6, I do use it as well because it is nice to have the carbon monoxide sensor in that thing. 
and uh, backup ARs because I absolutely do not trust. Like if I happen to get myself into a situation of you know in inadvertent IMC in the Harvard, that's not going to go well. So to have a backup uh, AHAR is handy, is good. So yeah, it's always with me and it's a question of whether or not I hang it. It just depends on what I'm in. Typically not hanging it in the RB14. Awesome. Uh, next up here, does ForeFlight have uh, a textbook, especially for new users or converts to ForeFlight, as in a textbook, uh, not an online instruction handbook? Thomas, can you answer that one? Yeah, so directly inside of the app, inside of the, the documents catalog is the ForeFlight pilot's guide in there. And yeah, that can be saved for offline use. Uh, you can transfer it to other programs if you have a different reader that you like to use. Um, so you don't need to be online to use that. And it's built directly inside of ForeFlight. One of the biggest benefits of having that right there is it gets updated every time that ForeFlight puts out a new version. And, and Steve, we were talking about that earlier, that we ship a new version every month. Uh, so that would be a, a lot to keep up with. Um, but luckily, you don't need to worry about it. Um, when you do go online, it'll download the newest version, and that way you'll have all of the information you need on how to use those new tools that we add all the time inside of ForeFlight. Perfect. Um, next up for Steve, uh, can we see an example cheat sheet? And you, you yeah. might need to remind people what what the the context of that question was because it I think it made sense at the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the cheat sheet is every single airplane I fly, I have a cheat sheet which I try to keep down to one or two pages of like key important points. So I thought about un unwiring myself to go get it, but I didn't. Ha like I was like, I'm not going to do that during this thing. So I don't have them in front of me here. But what I will do is post. I'll make a public post on Patreon or something so anybody can have access to see them, and I'll share a few of them in the next day or two. Uh, if people want to see them, but it's anything from like the V speeds, which is obvious to like gotchas. So, you know, um, for instance, the Harvard using the power setting example is like when you're setting climb power, you have to pull it back past where you want it in the manifold pressure to bring it all the way back to 27 inches. Because when I reduce the RPM, it's going to change the, the manifold pressure is going to go to 28. Like I want to end up at 28 inches and 2000 but I have to pull the manifold back to 27. You know what I mean, that kind of thing. So just these little gotchas for whatever types, things that I've noticed I've forgotten. Like for instance, Blake's plane, I have to remember lights, camera, action, turn on the transponder, don't take off without it. Whereas in the RV14, I don't need to because it senses the speed and it just is on. I mean, I do the same thing in the Harvard too. It's like, I gotta remember to put it out of standby mode, which is frustrating, goofy thing to forget, but I actually have that on my cheat sheet. So any gotchas, anything specific, uh, anything weird about the type, just remind myself outside of standard obvious SOPs that work across the board. So yeah, every every type that I fly, I got the cheat sheet. And if it's something new that I'm gonna fly with someone I've never flown with before, I'll usually try to work that out in advance and have a conversation with them and say, can you give me the main gotchas just so I can study those in advance. So when I get there, I remember that, you know, something like the chipmunk has a, doesn't have brakes on the pedals. It's a handle called the turn more handle. So if you want to turn the rudder stops being effective at below a certain speed and with less without a certain amount of RPM thrust on it, you have to dab the brakes if you want to be able to control it on the roll and even for taxiing. So just things like that are, are so and I carry those documents physically as well as having them in four flights so that it's right there with me so that I can look at a digital version, which is what I was doing for the Harvard on the way that day and with my buddy's 182. I was studying my cheat sheet, so when I got there, I was prepared for my quick currency flight, which went well, then I could fly with him. So showing up prepared and the cheat sheets really help. Highly recommended. Yeah, it sounds like a really uh, smart practice to be in the habit of. Next up here, even if you fly the same type sometimes, you have speed in knots and sometimes in miles per hour. Yeah, so one of my early instructors taught me, especially with tailwheel flying, don't stare at the instruments, you know, especially when you're trying to figure out rotation speed or, or landing speed. Glancing quickly, the, the, number, the positions on the clock tend to be the same. Am I right? Is that crazy? It does seem to apply. So it doesn't really matter what the number is, if, where the needle position is. Once you know where it needs to be, that's going to be VREF or whatever. At least that's how it worked with Super Cub. Um, so that's been my experience is like, don't fixate so much on the number as far as 
more think about the feel and then where the needle needs to be. I don't know if that's a terrible answer, but <laughs> that's been my experience is that um, a lot of it can be done by feeling it and then ballparking it if you're not fully sure. But obviously that's why the cheat sheet is there as well. So you can remember this one's in knots, this one's in MPH. And you know, these are the number of differences. Just don't forget that. Awesome. Um, another question for Steve here. Uh, what's your ideal cross country flight in the RV 14 when filing IFR? I don't know yet. <laughs> I mean, literally <laughs> the only cross country I've done with it has been to AirVenture. And we've we've only just kind of gotten we're kind of getting toward the end of the engine break in. So I've done a couple locals and no official IFR flying because I only just got the paperwork officially done. So it's now officially instrument certified. But I want to go do some training with with Dennis, probably my my longtime instructor from home and think through some workflow stuff so that when I'm filed in the system, what is the best way to work with this airplane? And I do intend to fly it down to Garmin actually and do their training program in March. I think we're set up to do that. So I'm going to fly it down there, kind of limp my way there, doing the best I can, knowing what I know, and then do the training with them to really get an idea of what should be the workflow. How should I work with this whole, there's so much capability in that panel, but it's so easy to not exploit it if you don't know how to use it. So yeah, this, this is the beginning of trying to use that airplane operationally. So come join the journey while I figure it out, because that's what Flight Shops is about. Yeah, so the, there were a couple of questions related to the uh, Steve story about the iPad overheating, and specifically they were wondering why why it might have overheated. And Steve, it, it sounds like it you think it was mainly because it was just in the sun for too long on a, a hot day. Absolutely. So that was that was a hot day. You can you can see in that video I'm flying with the window open like the whole time in the in the the uh, Cherokee Six. So even Blake was like, "Did you really fly with the window open the whole time?" I'm like, uh huh. It was that hot that day. Um, so yeah, yeah, I had it mounted up. I guess it was on the on the uh, yoke, and it cooked it. So and then people are asking about the case. So um, there's a lot of options for cases on the market, and I'm gonna try not using a closed up case in the RV. So you saw where I did my test mount position. I'm gonna try using one of the grabby ones that just holds the iPad without a case. And I, I ordered the new iPad in the white or whatever color it's called, the not black. So I'm thinking. And and I have a nice uh, air whatever the vent thing in the in the RV14 is right there, so it'll be blowing air onto the back of the iPad, right where I have it, and it won't be in a case that'll stop the airflow. So I think that'll help because that that canopy is a big bubble. I mean, it's going to cook in there. Everything's going to cook in there. So uh, that's my plan is to try to figure out a way to mount that iPad without it overheating. Because that's if there's any Achilles heel to this whole thing is is the iPad. They're offline. And that's important is if you have backups, you better make sure they're not all sitting in the same spot because then they'll all fail at the same time when they all overheat, right? So keep you know your phone in your pocket and your, your other iPad in your bag that you can reach so that when one fails, it's probably overheated. Like you should go prepared with them all charged. So I gotta say the, the largest risk of a failure is gonna be overheating. That's because almost always because of the sun. I don't know, can you guys agree with that? Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, I think that keeping it out of the sun where you can um one that i've had great luck with and obviously we we get very warm aircraft uh here in texas uh is just bringing the brightness down a little bit um 95 percent brightness is a lot nicer on the device than 100 percent brightness uh, that's cool on there. Know that. um and it's kind of like running the engine at redline versus you know run it at a 2700 um it's it's not a whole lot of difference and it makes a huge impact on the device as far as what you're trying to pull through it so uh, i was today down a little bit you'll still like still be able to read it uh and it'll behave a lot nicer for you so. yeah and, and we did um earlier i think it was this year we released an update that uh forflight will actually like attempt to warn you uh, of an overheating device before it fails and it we can't 100 percent guarantee that that'll happen because sometimes it'll heat up so fast that it'll just you know, die before the warning can pop up, but we. I think that is the warning I got that day. But that's oh, oh yeah. Oh, you better take it out. Like you have to take it out of the way. So that's mm -hmm. when I took it out of the way. Um, but I think it still ended up overheating. It just gave me the warning, like you're going to lose it. I think that's that's I'm pretty sure that's how it played out. But I just knew I well, I was going to I couldn't keep it where it was. Like it was going to mm -hmm. not work. And and the problem was I was sitting on the ground. That's when it's getting so hot. So it wasn't until I was flying that I could confidently say it was. You know, it's partly why the window open. 
but I did not know the 95% brightness thing. That's a, that's a great tip because yeah, that makes total sense. Cool, yeah. Uh, so next up here, is there a way to keep two iPads synced together in the cockpit so one could be mounted and the other could be used as a kneeboard? Thomas, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I think it's a great question to segue into about talking about backups is how do you keep everything uh, in sync here? Uh, and Steve, we were talking about making sure that everything is synced up and ready to go before your flight, making sure that you've got everything charged, making sure that you've got every you know pack run on all of your devices so that all of your charts and plates are downloaded um, on there, because that is something that you're not going to be able to transfer back and forth once you're in the air. Um, you can't do a transfer of that saved charts and data uh, on there. So make sure that that is all done ahead of time. And that pre-planning will, will save you a lot of trouble. Uh, once you get in the air though, uh, you may be using one mounted and that's sort of uh, where you're monitoring your flight plan or anything like that. And another one that you're using here as a, as a kneeboard, um, and you may be playing around with your route as you get uh, vectored around, as you get um, things that, that change your, your plan. One of the nice things built into ForeFlight is called Cockpit Share. Uh, and you can actually learn about that in that pilot's guide uh, we were talking about earlier, where as long as each of the devices are on a Wi-Fi network, uh, and that's what the Sentry ADSB uh, unit uses, you can actually transfer a flight plan back and forth between those devices. So if you are using one as a kneeboard and you plan around a diversion or anything like that, you can then use that, that Wi-Fi network to send that flight plan over to your other device. So you don't need to then try and type it in twice. You can just hit an accept button uh, on that, that other iPad. Easy way to keep the two in sync uh, as you go along. Awesome, thanks Thomas. So uh, we're about to wrap up here and I think uh, we'll just go ahead and do one more question here for Steve. Uh, where did you get that kneeboard? Is that the one with the notepad under the tablet? Yeah, that one is a pivot case. Um, so like I said, that I've had that one for a long time and I'm, I'm looking at what's newer in terms of allowing more airflow. I think that's the biggest problem with that one is like they kind of market it as being a rugged super duper like drop it off a cliff case and it's like true um but uh i haven't dropped my ipad off very many cliffs but i've had a lot of sun cooking ipads so i want to i want to try to look at not it being as i'm going to do a better job carrying it in a protective bag and then once i get to the plane it gets mounted anyway but i'm going to keep the backup one as that one in the pivot case and then my new one is going to be I'm gonna give it a shot. No case. Gonna just use the grabby sort of RAM, I guess, makes that. It's just a grabby one that can hold. And, and I think that also could easily scale down to a phone, which is kind of key because if you like that, the problem of not having a mounting solution for your backup isn't good, right? Like, so your main iPad fails, that one clicks in and, and now throw it away. It's like, oh, here's my backup, but now what? It's in my hand. And same with the phone, like what am I gonna do with that? Not, it's not ideal. So if I could just throw the one that failed in the back and clip my phone into the same place where that was, that's ideal. So I think that's where I'm heading is like one of those ones that's spring loaded and then it, it doesn't care what it's grabbing. That's a that's a great one to think about. It, it's something we have in the the EFB checklist that's built in uh, inside of ForeFlight there, um, is how are you gonna use this inside of the aircraft? Um, backup's great if it's got all your data on it and it's charged and ready to go, but you bring up a great point where if you're used to having your iPad in your sight line ready to go the whole time and now suddenly you have to hold it uh, while you're in maybe a situation where you're, you're having to do extra work, um, it, it's not as useful for you. Um, so a flexible mount like that sounds like a great addition to the aircraft. And just let me answer one quick one I see at the bottom here is someone's kind of concerned that I'm not using checklists because of the cheat sheets, it's like, no, those are completely supplemental. So the cheat sheets are to get me to the airplane. I'm not reading the cheat sheet while I'm flying. The cheat sheet is my, like, on the way to the airport, I brief myself and then when I get there, I look at it one more time or the night before, that's the cheat sheet. In the airplane, it's absolutely checklist. And again, in for flight, I take the real checklist, bring it in, so it's, it's all the items from the real checklist are there. Plus, I can add things. Like, for instance, in the T6, my trim, set trim isn't exactly helpful if I haven't flown the T6 in 60 days and I forget 11 and three. Like that's a very key part of setting trim in the T6, 11 and three, but you better get it right. <laughs> so yeah, sorry if that wasn't clear. There's no way that the uh, cheat sheets are 
superseding checklist. It's the other way around. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, this has been great. I think with, with that, we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up here. Um, thank you both for, for taking the time to, to have this great discussion. Um, obviously, if, if you guys are interested and if you don't know about Fly Chops and haven't seen anything from him, definitely go to YouTube and, and check out some of his other videos. Um, if, if what you saw in this webinar wasn't enough to convince you of that, um, you can also learn about our app releases at forflight.com slash releases. You can watch a recording of this webinar starting uh, maybe tomorrow afternoon at forflight.com slash webinars. And from there, you can also register for any of our other upcoming webinars. And then of course, if you have any questions and we do have a number of unanswered questions still, didn't have time to get to those, but uh, we we want everyone to be satisfied uh, with an answer or at the very least receive an answer to their question. So please email them to team at fourflight.com. Um, our team knows to expect uh, a barrage of questions after these webinars, so they will be looking forward to answering them. So Thomas and Steve, thanks again, guys. Uh, it's been really great.